Welcome to Wounded for War, featuring the Bible teaching of Phil Santo. This broadcast is an online video teaching through the Bible to help people rethink Jesus and his mission, to seek out the hurt, the lost, and the broken. So grab your favorite drink and a seat and join us as we start today's talk. It's really good to be with you guys again. Uh, today, we are jumping back into uh, the series that I've been talking through uh, in 1 Corinthians. And it's a series that we're calling uh, Messed Up But Loved. Uh, the Corinthian church was a, a church that certainly had its problems. Not only would I say it had its problems, but um, they were big ones. And they were within the church. And so they were being corrected by Paul the Apostle. We'll read about in 1 Corinthians this morning. Uh, one of the beginnings of their problems. Um, so they they had issues with church leadership, um, with morality and sexual problems. And one of the one of the first ones that Paul addresses is the fact that they were a divided church. That they were a church that didn't really uh, have unity whatsoever. Sound familiar? You may um, have noticed that the church today is not a unified body, that it's made up of a number of different um, viewpoints, if you will. Uh, there's, there's minor things and there's major things. There's minor things that we um, divide over and major things that we unify over. And Paul's going to address where the line becomes um, muddy, where we step from preference into um, condemning others for their preference. And so let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at what we see in 1 Corinthians. Uh, but before I get started, if you don't mind, I'd like to pray and uh, start our time out that way. Father, uh, I come before you, and I thank you for your grace and for your mercy today. Lord, I ask that you would author our thoughts, that you would give us a time in your word where we are um, awakened to the things of you, where we are um, aware, Lord, of what you're doing how you work, and that, Lord, we would be a people that uh, resemble you and seek to unify with others, not divide. Teach us. Help me to get out of the way and your Holy Spirit to lead us in this time. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go ahead and read this section. It says, uh, Now I exhort you, brethren, in, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 10. It says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. So, the first thing that we notice right off the bat that we should take notice of, is Paul was a man of authority. 
He was a Christian leader within the church. He had authority to go in there and to just kind of start demanding, hey, you guys are off basis, get back on course. But a good leader, as Paul was, wouldn't do that. Instead, your Bible might say, now I exhort you, brethren. And that sounds strong, right? I exhort you. But actually, the, the best translation from the Koine Greek original word would be that, um, that he's pleading, that he's begging, that though he has this authority, what he's actually doing is he's going to them and saying, hey, brothers, come on, don't do this. What are you doing? Don't divide. Please, I beg you, unify. And so the first thing we could learn is, is the approach of a leader correcting other people. Is that even when you have the authority, you don't need to take that approach. Jesus didn't. He came down to the earth. He didn't rail on us. Hey, guys, you guys are completely off basis. Let me just shake you uh, back into the realities. No. It says that in the Bible that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Well, who does he use? He uses me and you, right, to point out people's uh life circumstances and need for Christ. Well, that should look in a, in a way then that's merciful and gracious and gentle and kind and pleading, not demanding. He goes on and he says, uh, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you. That word divisions also um, can be misconstrued a little bit. That word divisions is schismata uh, in the Koine Greek, which, you know, we get our word schism from, but it's not a, necessarily a group, okay? What the word originally meant was to rent or to tear apart, to divide in a way that wasn't just to say, hey, here's a group and here's a group. And, no, it was saying, um, don't, Paul saying, don't tear each other apart. Don't just make your groups. No, don't tear each other apart. Don't divide in a way that literally leaves carnage. He says, don't divide among you. Don't rip each other apart. But that you be made complete in the same mind, in the same judgment. What Paul's trying to describe here is that they would be made complete. Um... What does he mean by complete? Made of use. It's like setting a bone back in order that was broken, right? If you have a broken bone, it's of no use. If I try and walk on a leg, it's broken. I'm in deep trouble uh, because it's not going to bear my weight. It's not going to do what it's designed for, right? And in the same way, Paul's saying, if you tear the body of Christ apart, it's not able to do what it's designed for. But if you mend that bone and you put that bone back into place where it actually is mended, then it becomes of use to the Lord. It becomes a, a useful tool. And that's what he's saying. Don't, don't be divided. Instead, uh, be made complete. And how does he say to be made complete? Uh, of the same mind and the same judgment. In the same mind, in the same judgment. He's not saying uh, conform to uniformity. The difference before, between unity and uniformity. And he's calling us to unity. He's saying um, it's okay to divide and have preferences and, and in the sense of, of, hey, you believe that um, minor detail about baptism that you can be sprinkled, and I believe that you need to be dunked. Um, that's not going to change whether you are uh, a child of God or not. It, it's not going to make it or break it. It's just a, a, a preference of my thought and my interpretation in the Scripture. Now, it, it doesn't change the narrative overall of what Jesus did, who he was. What it does is it's just a minor detail um, that, that surrounds the ideology of Christ, but it doesn't change the ultimate uh, mission of him, nor his power. I, I like how one of my pastors used to say, you minor in the minors and you major in the majors. 
The problem is, is that at, at the church uh, level, most of the people today, they major in the minors. So what do we divide over in the church today? We divide over all sorts of stuff, styles of worship, the music. Um, I will like contemporary, well, I like the hymns. And so we literally will choose a church based on music styles. Or maybe it's the, the length of the message, right? This guy talks way too long. Or um, the messages are 45 minutes versus 25 minutes. And so just based on that, you'll choose a church. Or ministry focus. Maybe uh, a church has a specific focus. All of them ought to be focused and centered on Christ. But the way that they reach the community is going to be in different expressions. God uses different people uh, for, for the character of who they are. Because they're going to reach different people. Look, I, I, I make no uh, qualms about it. I'm the type of uh, pastor in which reaches majority of the people that are not from the church that want nothing to do with the church because I've had a lot of trauma from the church. I've been personally beat up by the church and I've dealt with a lot of restoration with the church. And that's at a pastor level. And so God uses that, all of my experiences in life. He also uses my uh, past drug addiction or sexual uh, problems as a child being uh, molested or, you know, Things, all sorts of things. God will use your past, which also means that He's gonna, it's gonna have a flavor. It's gonna have a, a nature and a character all in and of itself. You see, the gospel message is too big for one character. If you just had one person, kind of like in the days of Moses, right? God used one person, but there wasn't as many people, groups. Now, if I was to go to Pakistan and teach, they probably wouldn't come off with the same, um, in the same way. I don't have the cultural norms of the day. I don't understand them. So God uses different people in different ways. So we don't look for uniformity. We look for unity. It's okay to have a preference to say, hey, I prefer this type of worship style. Why? Because it, it brings me closer to God. What's not okay, it, Paul's describing here, is, is when we start to tear each other apart. Well, how do we tear each other apart in those type of ways? Well, you know, you say, hey, that style of worship isn't really of the Lord. That's not legitimate. You start to tear it apart and say, no, I'm going to make a division. I'm going to make a distinction that isn't just a distinction or a division, but I'm going to say, you're not legit and I am. You see, that's what Paul starts to say that these guys have been doing. It says that he got a report. For I have been informed concerning you, my brothers, by Chloe's people, um, that there are quarrels among you. You know, um, this person, Chloe, obviously, uh, Paul's in, in Ephesus right now, and these people were over in uh, Corinth. And Chloe was a businesswoman who had people or representatives that were going back and forth between the two cities. And so what happened was, is Chloe's people or representatives for business were out doing, um, you know, meeting with merchants and things like that, doing daily business. They run across Paul while he's in Ephesus and they say, hey, Paul, some things are going down back at the church that you built and it's not good. They're tearing each other apart and they're tearing each other apart in a way through quarreling specifically and um, what are they quarreling about is it about doctrine is it about styles of worship methods of ministry it's literally unfortunately about who they're following a leader paul goes on to say that this is their main problem. Now I mean this, that each of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified? Paul gets snarky here. He gets the, a bit of attitude, and he's just kind of like, are you kidding me? Was, was I crucified for you?
Paul, um, in this moment, Paul's really got attitude because he just can't believe it. But yet, isn't this the case today? Well, I'm, I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Presbyterian, and we got it right. Or I'm from the Calvary movement, or I'm from this movement, or that tribe, or whatever group, right? And, and, and what they're really saying, and, and I've been guilty of it myself early on in my walk with Christ. I thought, I'm of Calvary Chapel. We study the Word of God. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but, but in order. Uh, we got, we got the, the, the fast track. And everybody else, man, that, I felt bad for them. Not realizing that it's just another expression that's meeting a certain need in a community and drawing certain types of people to Christ. I needed Calvary Chapel, the way I was built, the way God formed me, the experiences God allowed me to have in life. I needed Calvary Chapel. Now, the church down the street wasn't any worse or better. The difference was is that God knew that there were certain people that needed that pastor, that ministry. So Paul's saying, don't follow men. And, and why were these guys doing that, by the way? You know, if you look at um, who they're talking about, Paul says, you know, I, uh, I follow, I'm of Paul, one group says. This is the, the factions or the groups. Uh, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. I'm of Paul. Why would they say that? Well, because he was the founder of the church. Well, we followed the guy who originally started this movement, and so therefore we're right. Well, the other people were like, no, 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 but you don't understand. Since then, there's been this guy named Apollos. And Apollos was known for being a, a very, very intellectual, very spiritually gifted orator. This guy could knock your socks off. I mean, Paul already told us that he's not a very good speaker. So if he's not a very good speaker, and they get this guy that's you know dynamic and, and amazing, they're saying, hey, no, 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 we follow the amazing guy. So we're better. And then the other one says, well, we're of Cephas. Why Cephas? It's another word for Peter. We're, we're with the guy. We're part of the group that, you remember, uh, Jesus said that he gave the keys of the kingdom to Peter. Well, we're with that guy. We're with the guy that Jesus approves of. And then there's always a, that group, right? The, the holier than thou people, the holy rollers, the ones that uh, were of Jesus, I'm, I've been homeschooled. I only know Jesus. Um, you know, uh, usually they're very arrogant and extremely uh, annoying to be around. What Paul's getting at is that these people were saying, I'm of this one and, and I'm better than you because of that. Or I'm legit and you're not. They're tearing apart. But who bleeds when man tears the body of Christ apart? You see, they're not just tearing the body of Christ apart to point out that they were following a better leader. It's, it's about them. It's not about even the leader. It's not like, hey, this leader is a better leader. Go follow him. They were saying, I'm more legitimate than you. It's, it's pride. That's the same root problem today, is pride. I love what Paul does with this. When, when, when you have man and pride, the best water for that flame is Christ. Paul, yeah, he, he does it in a snarky way. You know, was I crucified for you? Um, has Christ been divided? Are you guys insane? What are you thinking, in other words, right? He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. By the way, um, if baptism was required for uh, salvation, he's in sin right there. He's talking in a blasphemous way. Because you would say, oh, no, 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 I, I want to be a part of every baptism if, if it's essential for salvation. But he doesn't seem to be uh, pointing that direction in this moment. Uh, he, he literally says so that none of you uh, were baptized in my name. 
Now, I did baptize also the household of Stephanos beyond that. I don't uh, remember whether I baptized any of you, right? But he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize. He brings it back to the core central issue that it's about Jesus. Don't forget, this isn't about men or who you are. You don't bring anything to the table and nor does your leader. He says, but, but he was called instead not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The good news. That's what that word gospel means. Good news. I was called just to bring you some good news. Not to tear you apart, but to share with you the faithfulness of a God who cares about you, who loves you, though you didn't measure up. Sin, the word sin just means missing the mark. So you missed the mark. You missed the boat. As my dad used to say, you screwed the pooch. <laughs> but what, what now? Well, someone paid your ticket. Someone made up for the shortcomings. Someone completely um, made away when you had no way. That's what Paul says he was called to preach, the gospel. And by the way, not in cleverness of speech, he says, so that the cross would not be made void. You know, that's quite interesting to me. And the reason why is because it seems to intimate that, um, that there is a way that you could preach the gospel and make it void. Otherwise, he wouldn't make that statement. And how is that? What could make the gospel void? He, he says, in cleverness of speech. I didn't come with cleverness of speech because that would make it void. In other words, men trusting on the cleverness of their own ways, their tactics. Coming in saying, hey, uh, Apollos, by the way, you're a great speaker. You're amazing. We want you to try this new strategy. We'll think, we think that you'll gain 100 more new followers. The Bible says that God adds to his church daily as we're just being faithful to what he's called us to do. We don't create anything. And if we do, whatever you um, obtain, you'll have to maintain. But if God obtains it, it's his job to maintain it. It's much easier when the Lord's adding to it daily and you're not having to use them, uh, use these, these tactics and, and dazzling people because you'll always have to one up yourself. Whereas if you use the tactics of God, his good news, the gospel message, it'll continue to attract people. You won't have to do it with cleverness of speech. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the love of Christ that turns people back to him. You know, in my own walk, I've had a, a few incidences with people like this. Prideful people that wanted to divide the church. I deal with an individual on a weekly basis that um, what they want to talk about constantly is these little um, areas of doctrine or specialty areas of, of uh, you know, uh, sideline issues, nothing major, but they want to make a major every time and they want to divide over it every time. And it's never healthy. That individual never brings to the table fruit from their walk, just complaints about other people's walks. It's a miserable life. It's not good news. My prayer for you is that you learn to love others and not divide. How are we going to do that? Well, the beginning of it is focusing on Jesus, not on others. Focusing on the one who gave his life for you. Remembering that it came at a heavy cost, not just uh, your salvation, but he said that he came in First John for the sins of the whole world. So, His action was not just for you, so don't be arrogant. It was for all of us. Now, whether you accepted it or not, it's a different story, but the reality is he did it for everybody. 
So even the guy that has, or the gal that has a wrong doctrine or, or they're off a bit in this one area or whatever, God still loves them. So let's be gracious and kind and merciful because he's been gracious and kind and merciful. Amen. Next week, we'll jump in. We'll dive into the next set of scriptures. Until then, love you guys.